most of which are hugely significant and remain hugely significant uh, events to this day. Um, of course, because that region is still a focal point for national security, and it was even during the Great War I as well. So we see that 1917 is a really important year in terms of big geopolitical politics, big geopolitical strategy. We also see, though, that 1917 is a year of absolute frustration for the Allies and for Imperial Germany. 1917 was a year of indecision in that we see a stalemated war on the Western and Eastern Front. We see a war that had devolved into an attritional conflict in which the side that will last the longest in terms of war materiel, that will last the longest in terms of their ability to wage war on both Western and Eastern Fronts, will eventually win the war. But in the minds of people in 1917, and one thing to keep in mind is that when, when we look at 1917 with hindsight, we tend to see it as the year before the Great War is decided in Europe, right? In 1917, though, the minds of all political leaders, of all strategists, they are seeing the war as becoming an increasingly desperate struggle. And a struggle not just in terms of kind of, you know, the traditional way in which European armies had fought, where you would have a war that's being waged, and then after the war there would be a peace settlement, but nations would go on with the peace settlement afterward. Instead, in 1917, it shows us that this war will be a war for not only national survival, but imperial survival for nation states. And Russia becomes the big example. If something goes wrong in the war, if, um, if, if there is a collapse on the home front, if there's a revolution on the home front, it could lead to the destruction of a nation and the destruction of an empire. Okay, so 1917 is a huge, huge year, and it's a year that's very, very worrisome uh, for the Allies. It's also a year that exposes the weakness of political regimes, in which we see events that are happening on the war front having a direct impact on what's happening on the home front. So whenever I talk about a military campaign this afternoon, or whenever I talk about something that's happening in the war, always keep in the back of your mind that there is a connection between success or failure on the battle, battlefield and political success or failure at home. And indeed, the nation that's able to last the longest and maintain a political and social structure intact within the Great War is going to be the nation that is victorious or going to be the side that's victorious in, in the war. Okay? So what I'd like to do is just give you some background into ways in which we think about the First World War's phases. Okay? Just leading up into 1917 so that we can then drill down on what happens during 1917. The war, of course, opens in 1914. And in 1914, we see the first phase of the war being one of open warfare. Okay? And when we say open warfare, we mean that the hopes of generals, the hopes of general staffs, are that this war can be decided quickly based on maneuver, based on mobilization timetables, that there would be a decisive battle or a decisive campaign and a short war. Okay? This is 1914 and we see open war on eastern fronts, uh, which we mean mostly Poland okay, and Serbia. We also see open warfare on the western front. However, open warfare comes with significant drawbacks for general staffs. This leads to incredibly, incredibly high casualties of early professional armies that are engaged in 1914. And nations then had to kind of reassess how they're going to fight this war. If it can't be decided with a decisive battle in a form of open warfare or a decisive campaign, then how is it going to be decided? That's a big question for generals in 1914 and into 1915. So what we end up seeing is a scramble by nations, by empires to find other allies to help them prosecute the war. We see um, the Allies, Great Britain and France, turning to Italy in 1915, and then Romania in 1916 to form an alliance to hopefully open up that another theater of war against the Central Powers. We see the Central Powers, Germany and Austria-Hungary, look to other allies, the Ottomans, 
and Bulgaria in particular to open up other theaters that will expose imperial insecurity for Great Britain or for France. Okay? So we see in 1914 to 1915 a scramble for alliances, a scramble to, for generals and their staffs to actually figure out how this war can be prosecuted, how it can potentially be won. The war then moves into its next phase. And in, by late 1915, we see generals starting to talk about this war being as one that is being waged for exhaustion, or it's what the Germans call materiel schlacht, right? It's a war that's being fought based on materiel, being, being fought to exhaust your enemy, and it's the first time we start to hear the term war of attrition, right, that's being used in 1915 going into 1916. And it's in 1916 that we see some of the great attritional struggles of the war. And I think it's a misnomer to call battles like Verdun or the Battle of the Somme actual battles, okay? Because they are campaigns. They are, these campaigns last for months. They have dozens of battles within, the, within each campaign. And each one of these battles causes hundreds of thousands of casualties in 1916. So by the end of 1916, what we end up seeing, right, what we end up seeing are nations and general staffs that are in many ways reeling because the nature of warfare has changed. The war that they expected is not the one that they're fighting. When they have tried to fight new, innovative type of campaigns, it hasn't necessarily worked, in particular on the Western Front which is this space of 475 miles of trench lines that have been done. Uh, and what they end up seeing, okay, is a war in which has frustrated them for its first two years, okay? And by late 1916, we're talking not just a war that's being waged with hundreds of thousands of casualties, but we see casualties rising into the millions, okay, on all sides, um, casualties going into the millions. So what does this mean? Well, it means that at the end of 1916, the elusive nature of victory, okay, heavy losses have meant a change in strategy, a change in the way in which nations are looking to prosecute the war. In Germany, we see the emergence of two figures. Um, we see the emergence of two figures. We see Eric Ludendorff and <coughs> Paul von Hindenburg, okay, who end up becoming uh, the chief of, gen of the general staff and then the quartermaster general of the German army. Okay? Their, their job is to create a new mechanism for organizing German war victory. Okay? And they decide to create a new economic system in which they will hopefully harness all of the resources of the state and German Empire to be used for the war effort. But they also come up with a new strategy in which Germany is not going to fight a costly offensive like for Dunn again on the Western Front in 1916, but instead in 1917, what they're going to do is hold their position on the Western Front. Okay? <coughs> and by holding their position, what they're going to create they're going to create what's called the Siegfried Stellum or the Hindenburg Line. Okay? They withdraw part of their lines on the Western Front, they straighten out trench lines, and in doing so, they free up divisions of German troops to be transferred to other places. Okay? So they adopt in-depth, strong de defenses on the Western Front, and they wait for their enemy to attack them while reorganizing the German war economy. In France, we see a major change as well. Okay? We see General Joffre is replaced by a new general, uh, a hero of Verdun, General Nivelle, becomes the general in chef, the, the, the general in chief of the French army. Okay? He had fought at Verdun. He was regarded as an innovative thinker, an innovative general, and there was a lot of hope that he could prosecute the war in 1917. In Britain, we see something of a political crisis in, 19, in late 1916, in December of 1916, in which the previous Prime Minister, Liberal Prime Minister, H. H. Asquith, is ousted by one of his cabinet members. He's ousted by Lloyd George. And Lloyd George becomes the Prime Minister in Britain for the rest of the war. Lloyd George forms a coalition government, 
You'll see this again in 1940 when a coalition government is formed around Churchill in which members of oppositional political parties are brought into the government so that the government can have a unified force for the prosecution of the war. Lloyd George becomes the prime minister of a government that includes both liberals and conservatives within his government. And this government is committed to fighting the war until the surrender of Germany. There would not be a separate peace under Lloyd George. Okay. So we see a political crisis in Britain, we see a general ship shake up in France, and we see a reorganization of the war economy within, um, within, uh, within um, Germany. So I first want to turn to, to the east and have us look at what's going on in Russia. And we're going to take a roughly chronological approach here. Okay. So what we see in Russia is a massive offensive in 1916 called the Brusilov Offensive. Has anyone heard of this, the Brusilov Offensive? Major offensive within the east, and, uh, and initially the, the Russian army is successful with this offensive and that they've got the Austro-Hungarians on the run. They take huge swaths of territory, okay? But like all offensives in the East, it dies down. Lines of communications become extended, men become tired, okay? Uh, the armies become exhausted that are fighting, and the Germans are able to reinforce the Austrians, okay? So the Brusilov offensive kind of peters out over the summer of 1916. And this is seen as Russia's great hope for beating the Austro-Hungarians and winning the war in the East. Okay? This doesn't happen, and it leads to great frustration at the front in the Russian army. Mass desertions over the winter of 1916 into 1917. A question of the Tsar's leadership. The Tsar himself is leading armies at the front in 1916, which means that if there's failure in the East, if there's failure with the Russian army, it's going to be tied to the Tsar and his regime. So the Tsar is at the front, he's trying to lead men, his men are deserting in droves. There's all kinds of logistical problems that are happening over the winter. In addition to that, we see food shortages and strikes in Petrograd and in Moscow. Okay? And these food shortages, strikes, eventually lead to demonstrations and riots in February of 1917. And it becomes so severe, okay, so se severe that civil authority basically falls apart, okay? And the Tsar is forced by his own government, by his own nobility, to abdicate. This is called the February Revolution in Russia, okay? It really takes place in March, March by our calendar. Um, but March 8th to 10th, we see strikes. We see the Russian legislature, which is called the Duma, they declare a new provisional government and force the Tsar to abdicate. Now this is hugely significant because think if you are in the cabinet of the British Empire who is allies with Russia. Think if you are in the French war cabinet. Okay? And all of a sudden your big ally in the east who's responsible with helping you wear down the Germans okay, from both sides, attack from both sides, wear them down. That's a strategy going into 1917. What if there's revolution in Russia? Huge insecurity, right? Well, the new provisional government reassures their allies and commits themselves to prosecuting the war against Germany. The only thing that changes is civil structure of government. The only thing that's changing is we're introducing new reforms within Russia, within the state internally. But, but, we are going to keep prosecuting the war against Germany. So at least in the minds, at least in the minds of those in Britain and France, for the time being, for the time being, they're feeling a bit more secure about events that are happening within Russia. Okay. Um, this, of course, changes over time, and we'll get to some of those changes in a few minutes. Okay. The second major event that happens early in, early in the war is or early in 1917 is that we see in the United States okay, see in the United States and kind of an increased 
militarization that comes for a number of factors, a number of reasons, okay? But the central reason in which we see a focus in the United States in early 1917 on, on war, on the possibility of war, is that the German Empire decides to reintroduce unrestricted submarine warfare on January 31st, 1917. Now, why is this so significant? Okay. Well, it's so significant because this is the very issue very issue that creates a political crisis between the United States government and Germany in 1915. Because in May of 1915, the Lusitania was sunk. Woodrow Wilson protested its sinking. He said famously, America, though, was too proud to fight. You've probably heard that quote. It's a, kind of a bad quote for him to say at the time. Okay, it didn't go over well with the press. Um, but Wilson. Wilson negotiated with the German government so that they would then put restrictions on submarine warfare. Early 1917, though, the German government rolls the dice. They know if they reinstitute unrestricted submarine warfare, which USW basically means that submarines can sink at will any ship that they see without warning. Okay? So if Germany reintroduces unrestricted submarine warfare, it could potentially bring the United States into war. The German high command is okay with that. They believe that the United States as a neutral power is eventually going to come in on the side of the Allies. And the goal for the German government is to end the war as quickly as possible. The surest way to do that is to sink shipping around Great Britain. They had a belief that if they can sink a certain amount of tonnage around Fortress Britain, they could potentially force the British Empire into a compromised peace. And they are wildly successful in implementing this policy. They underestimate British shipping, but they sink a ton, pun intended, of ships, okay, up around Fortress Britain. They also bring the United States into the war. The Wilson administration protests their decision to reinstitute unrestricted submarine warfare. German Foreign Office, Arthur Zimmerman, sends off a telegram that's intercepted by British intelligence. You've probably heard of it, the, Zimmergren, the, Zimmergren, uh, the Zimmerman telegram. It's intercepted by the British government and handed over to the Americans. And it promises Mexico in the, in, in the event of war uh, between Germany and the United States, if Mexico intervenes on the southern border, they get all the stuff that the United States took from them in the last war. Okay, They get the American Southwest. When this telegram comes out, it confirms every su suspicion that people on the fence within the United States have about Germany. That Germany is a hegemonic power, that they're out for some kind of militaristic world domination, or at least domination within Europe. It confirms everything that Allied propaganda has been saying to the United States. So Wilson ends up asking uh, Congress for, for a declaration of war, which he gets on April 6, 1917. Okay. Now, one of the difficulties is, is that the United States in April has a powerful navy, and that navy can come to the aid of Great Britain. Indeed, our navy sails over, our destroyers sail over, and they are patrolling off the coast of of, uh, of Ireland within three weeks of the declaration of war, okay? Our army, though, is very small, and the standing army in the United States will be used as kind of a nucleus for then building a mass army of over four million men. But it's going to take a year to raise that army. It's going to take more than a year to train those men to go into combat. And to show you kind of how small American participation is in the war effort in 1917, in January of 1918, we only have 150,000 doughboys in France. That's how many we've gotten over there since the declaration of war in April of 1917, between April 1917 and January of 1918. Okay. Of course, we'll send over hundreds of thousands in the spring of 1918. At the same time, American contribution in 1917 is very, very slim in terms of actual uh, contribution to the war effort, but very grand in terms of the overall um, moral decision of America entering on the side 
of the Allies. Since we're in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, and if you'll indulge me, I actually have some site-specific information about what's going on in Gettysburg during 1917. Would you like to hear that? Yes. Okay. So, early 1917, if you were living here, let's say in uh, March of 1917, so before the Declaration of War, you would have seen army caravans that were coming from Detroit to army bases on the eastern seaboard. So the U.S. was already preparing for potentially war in March, and these caravans were coming through town. They were reported in the Gettysburg Times. In early 1917, you see 200 Pennsylvania college students put down their beer glasses and start training as officer candidates for war in the event that we go to war with Germany. 200, okay? About half the population of Gettysburg College at that time, which is Pennsylvania College at that time. So if you were in town, if, if you were driving through campus, you would have seen college students training to become officers in the United States Army. Okay. On April 4th, two days before the declaration of war, a man by the name of J.W. Eichholz here in town, he was a local government official, he issued a proclamation here in town, two days before the declaration of war, saying that he was demanding all Gettysburgians fly the American flag from their homes because he said of all places to lead the nation in patriotic fervor none should be more prompt to show its devotion to the flag than Gettysburg which he called the most prominent historic spot on the western continent okay. um, and that's two days before the declaration of war the town clearly is not skittish about showing their uh, stars and stripes uh, we end up seeing, immediately after, after the declaration of war, uh, the local Red Cross here in town is able to recruit 1,200 members within their first month of operation of war mobilization. Uh, in addition to that, we see uh, a Liberty Loan campaign that in 1917 uh, will uh, raise almost $200,000 worth of Liberty Loans, which is a, an awful lot of money in 1917. Um, and of the five loan drives that the Liberty Loan Drive in Adams County does over, over the course of 1917 to 1918, they, they do five loan drives and they eventually raise $5 million for the war effort. Okay. We also see a bit more site specific here south of town, the U.S. Army builds its first mobilization camp here on the Gettysburg Battlefield in 1917. And local officials are really courting strong for the War Department to put a mobilization camp here for a number of different reasons. One, of course, patriotism, but the other side of it is for town profit, right? If you bring in thousands of doughboys training for war, they're going to spend, spend money here in town. And in 1917, we see regular U.S. Army infantry regiments, the 4th, elements of the 4th, the 7th, 61st U.S. Infantry, who've just come up from war against Pancho Villa, um, war being fought against Mexico in the South. They were brought up and trained here before they went overseas. And of course, in 1918, we will see a larger Army camp that forms here, Camp Colt, under the command of uh, Dwight, Dwight Eisenhower. So what we end up seeing is even in small towns like Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, Gettysburg is able to mobilize really quickly for war and actually have a huge contribution to a war effort that lasts only just over a year. Okay? Let's move to the principal theater of military operations, the Western Front. So the Western Front is the theater that you all know. Right? It is the foggy landscape in which the war has been prosecuted uh, for two years. It's the very face and epitome of stalemate in the First World War. Okay. Now, on the Western Front, uh, one way to think about it is not to think necessarily of the Western Front the same way that we would think of like military operations in the Second World War. There is no concept of grand strategy, okay? of a central kind of, um, um, a central com command structure that's an international sense of command structure uh, be between allies on the Western Front. 
Instead, allies are largely doing their own thing and meeting for conferences where they consult with each other, but they're not necessarily coordinating in a sophisticated way how they're going to fight or prosecute the war on the West. Now, strategically, both Nivelle and Field Marshal Haig, Nivelle for the French Army, Field Marshal Haig for the British Army, are determined to put pressure on the Western Front, while at the same time, hopefully, the Russians will put pressure on the Eastern Front against Germany. And the theory here in 1916, as well as in 1917, is if you keep putting pressure on Germany from each side, the German Empire will collapse. Okay? Militarily, there will be some sort of victory or breakthrough. In order to do this on the Western Front, both the French and the British plan for offensives in the spring of 1917. Okay? The British plan an offensive um, at, uh, at, at Arras, or at Vimy Ridge, in April of 1917, which is meant to be a subordinate attack to the main, main French attack to the south at Chemin d'Adam, which is in mid-April of 1917. And you see from the dates, both of these are being fought in April, that both of these major offensives, both of these major attacks are meant to put pressure and divide up German resources along the same front. Okay? Now, the British do well, in particular, because they set their sights on a limited sort of ob objective. So they have a military objective in Vimy Ridge that they want to capture. Okay? And they end up fighting a very innovative battle for Western Front standards on April 9th of uh, April 9th of 1917, in which the Canadian Corps, with support from British units, are able in one day to use combined arms tactics, where they're using artillery with infantry assaults, with planes doing a lot of intelligence spotting. Okay, they're able to use combined arms to take Vimy Ridge. A, a, a ridge, a German fortress that was thought to be um, almost impossible to take. The French had tried to take it in 1915 five times and failed. Okay? The British are able to take it, or the Canadians are able to take it, in one solid day of fighting. The British keep up the offensive within that region then to support the French farther to the south. Okay? So they keep up their offensive to support the French. Things don't go as well for the French Army, in part because of uh, because they're not being tactically innovative, but also in part because the Germans who are opposite them have developed new tactics for defense. The Germans have ad adapted a type of defense in depth, where rather than seeing kind of stagnant lines of trenches, they're using pillboxes and slit trenches to create, in many ways, mini fortresses al along their line. And some of these defenses are miles deep, okay? Miles deep, two, three, four miles deep, in which you have to fight from pillbox to pillbox, from slit trench to slit trench, okay? So when the French army goes over the top in mid-April of 1917, in one week's worth of fighting, they suffer horrific casualties. They lose in one week 30,000 men killed and 100,000 men wounded. It is so bad, it is so bad that the president of the French Republic demands of his general to shut down the offensive. This rarely ever happens, that a political figure will come in and say, end it right now, okay? He comes in and tells Nivelle to stop the offensive. Nivelle resigns. He is replaced by Philippe Pétain, who some of you know from Second... Second World War. In the First World War, though, he's not a Nazi <laughs> collaborator. He's a, he's a decent general. Okay, right. so Pétain replaces him. What then happens to the French army, which has suffered incredibly declining morale as a result of this bloody, bloody battle, is elements of the French army fall to mutiny. Okay? They fall into mutiny within their trenches. Now, the, now, this doesn't mean mutiny doesn't mean they're throwing down their rifles and walking away. They stay in their trenches, and for the most part, they are determined to fight if they're attacked by the Germans. What do they refuse to do? They refuse to fight in more futile assaults against defense in depth fortifications. Okay? Now, Patan sees the mutiny as a huge political crisis within his army. 
So he decides on kind of a, uh, a both a good cop and a bad cop sort of approach. The bad cop approach is he takes some central ringleaders and he executes them. He takes hundreds of other men and he gives them other sentences. Okay, so he comes down hard on the ringleaders. But then he institutes better food, better leave policies, more wine, more cigarettes, more chocolates, okay? Better quality provisions for the men within the trenches, more time away from the trenches. And he also says to them that they will not be involved in another offensive that summer, okay? He tells the men, no more attacks, we are resting and retraining you. You think that's gonna help the morale of the army? Yeah, okay, and it largely does. He handles the mutiny relatively well. It doesn't spread. The Germans don't even really know about it, okay? And the British don't even really know what's going on. What the British do know is that the, the British do know that the French are not going to be engaged in another attack that summer, which means then who does the burden of the war fall to in the Western Front? Falls to the British, okay? Who then begin planning for another major offensive this time in the north, in Belgium, at Ypres. Okay. So Field Marshal Haig turns his attention to a British offensive that he thinks can have strategic benefit in the north. And what he hopes to do is to attack uh, from Ypres eastwards to hopefully break through German lines and capture Belgian ports that have been turned into U-boat bases. British shipping is being sunk every single day. U-boats are leaving two Belgian ports and sailing into the channel and sinking those ships. Haig believes if he can sweep up the coast, he can take those U-boat bases and maybe even force a breakthrough or a decision of the German army in Belgium. Okay? So he decides to attack at Ypres. The first major engagement uh, is at Messine. It's fought in May, and it's got a very limited objective. It's very well done. They capture a major ridge. Um, notably, there are 19 underground mines that are exploded in this battle, killing 10,000 German soldiers when they blow them up. Okay, This is a very well planned, very, very well conducted battle. Difficulty is, though, Field Marshal Haig doesn't follow up on it immediately. Instead, he's not ready for another offensive within the region for another six weeks. And it's not until the end of July that the British begin their attack at the Battle of Third Ypres. Okay? On July 31st, we see attacks that do lead to gains in this theater. Okay? We see attacks that come with a very, very heavy cost. And one day, 27,000 casualties that's killed, wounded, and captured in these attacks, okay? August, though, proves to be a nightmare at Ypres. There are only three days in the month of August 1917 in which rain was not falling on the British Army that's trying to move. Now, the entire landscape has been destroyed at Ypres by what? By shell fire. Constant shell fire. And Ypres becomes a boggy mess. Men are not able to take their objectives. They're not even really able to orient themselves in their attacks. Uh, and they prove incredibly, incredibly costly. And I have a section from a soldier's letter here that shows you kind of the difference. This man was a lieutenant colonel in the British Army. I'm going to talk about him in a few minutes, I think. Um, but he's fighting in the British Army. He's, he's a lieutenant colonel. And he... He writes after the first day of this attack how proud he is of his men. The battalion does well. It captures all of its objectives, he said. The weather is vile in the trenches, but I am serene. Okay. Three weeks later, he writes his sister. We are living underground in a big system of tunnels, which are now some little way behind the line. There are really a number of narrow passages, about three feet wide, and never more than five foot nine inches high, usually less. They are really like a large system that there must be at least 250 men here, including several brigade staffs, our dressing stations, etc. So everything's been transferred into deep, deep dugouts. We are fairly comfortable. 
Um, we, fa we are fairly comfortable. We have an electric light and an electric fan, which are very excellent. Though for the last two days, the engine's broken down and we have been a bit stuffy. We come to the surface only on occasion to see if the war is still going on, but otherwise do nothing in particular. And this is no place for a country walk. So they have become bogged down. They are living in deep dugouts, deep dugouts at at Ypres. Okay. So what we end up seeing then is by the end of the fall, within within the British Empire, within the Brits fighting um, on the Western Front, we end up seeing that the Battle of Third Ypres, the Battle of Passchendaele, ends up costing them about two hundred and seventy-five thousand casualties. Germans probably somewhere in the realm of about about 200 200,000 okay. so the war itself is moving in directions um, that's uh, the same sort of stalemate that you would have seen in 1916 okay. there are some surprises though within within the war and this is kind of a point for me to end on and then I want to show you kind of a project we've been working at, on at Gatesburg College and then open up for, for a few questions um, in the Middle East, though, we see a different type of war that's being fought. In the Middle East, it's not like the Western Front. It's not like the Eastern theaters. Okay? In the Middle East, what we end up seeing is that the British Army has been engaged against the war, the war with the Turks since 1915. Um, at, at Gallipoli, at Kut, and, uh, which, is in, uh, uh, which is in Mesopotamia. And the British have made all kinds of promises to different people within, within the region. Okay? They've promised a Jewish state uh, for, um, uh, Jewish, state for, uh, for Jewish uh, Zionists. They have promised an Arab state to Arab nationalists. And they promised the French that after the war, the British and French empires will divide up the Middle East uh, with spheres of influence. There's all kinds of promises that the British army has made. What we end up seeing, though, are two major victories that take place in the war, uh, uh, the war uh, against Turkey. The one is in Mesopotamia. And a campaign is waged by General Maud in early 1917, in which he takes Baghdad in March of 1917. Which is the big city in Ma Ma Mesopotamia. Okay, so it seems like the British are winning in the Middle East. In the fall, we see a campaign that's being waged in Palestine by General Allenby. And Allenby is fighting in Palestine with the intention of taking Jerusalem, sweeping up the coast, taking Damascus, okay, and forcing the Turks out of the war. By December of 1917, Allenby has accomplished the first of his major objectives. He has taken Palestine as a present for his government, for Lloyd George's government. Okay. So in the Middle East, we do see a different type of war. It's a mobile war, but it's a war with some successes outside of the Western Front. Since we began with them, I want to quickly leave with them. And that is with Russia. Russia attempts to be a good citizen in the summer of 1970. The provisional government attempts to keep pressure on Germany. They launch another offensive in the summer of 1917. It fails though, and it leads to uh, it leads to not only disquiet but it leads to the Russian army crumbling in the face of the German army in the east. It also leads to a political crisis at home. And that political crisis is largely forced uh, by radicals, by Bolsheviks, which have come back to Russia with the intention of starting a, rev a revolution. They see an opportunity. They are brought into Russia. Lenin is famously smuggled by the Germans in a sealed boxcar back into Russia so that he can be a, a rabble rouser and cause exactly the type of revolution in which he does. But what we see is in November, uh, the Red Guards uh, under Trotsky and under Lenin 
are able to take over the Russian government and then begin uh, kind of a, 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 in many ways, a, a, a type of terror against their own citizens to consolidate their, their new government. Okay? This government, the, the Bolshevik government, will sue for peace with Germany, and in March of 1918, they will end up signing a treaty. Russia will end up leaving, leaving the war. So just very quickly, I want to point something out to you, and I'll take a few questions. At Gettysburg College, we um, we have a digital history project that we started. Uh, the one officer's letters that I read to you uh, is an officer by the name of Jack Pierce. Well, we have 273 of his letters at Gettysburg College that we have digitized and created a website around. So you can read his experiences 100 years to the day in which he fought during the Great War. And it's a collaborative, um, a collaborative project, which we're using students, um, we're using administrators, and we use social media to, uh, to bring this officer's story to light. So if you get a chance, look us up on Facebook. Definitely go to the site and have a look at it. It's jackpeers.org, and I have little cards if you want to have a look at it. But you can actually follow this fellow's journey on the Western Front 100 years to the day in which he fought. So thank you for your patience, um, and I'm happy to take any questions. Yep. I just want to know how you spell Pierce. P-E-I-R-S. It's the opposite of what you would think. Okay? Oh, okay. You'd think P-I, but it's P-E. And at least originally the family's name was spelled P-E-A-R-S. Pears. But according to family legend, there's a famous soap company by that name in Britain, and they didn't want to be identified with the soap company, so they changed the spelling of their name. We hear a great deal about the purging, of course, in the war, but very little is known or spoken of his boss in March. Uh, why is that? I think it's a good question. Um, I mean, I think in part it has to do with the way in which we want to remember the war, right? Um, that, I mean, I was going to make a comparison between Ike and Marshall, but which I, I think there's some degree of that, but we do remember General Marshall, right? Um, definitely. Um, I think part of it has to do with American war memory in that we tend to privilege the battlefield general or the person who's engaged in the front more than people that are actually doing the, the political heavy lifting, right? Um, so that might be part of the reason. Um, I think we should be remembering all of these guys, you know, but very few people talk about March, very few people even really talk about Pershing, right? When I talk about Pershing, my students know the name, but they don't know much about him beyond the name. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. September 26, 1918, the push came and they went over the top. Any idea how many people were killed on that day? My great uncle was killed on that day. Which day? Where is it? September 26, 1918. Yeah, uh, let me think. Um, yeah, I just, I, I just was rereading Ed Langell's book uh, on, on on that battle. Um, I'm not sure of the exact number, but yeah. They didn't keep good uh, records on a daily basis, but overall in the Meuse-Argonne campaign, uh, there were 122,000 killed and wounded. Yeah, and, and, and from what I understand, especially in that last week of September, they just weren't recording significantly what's going on. But it's, I mean, there's a lot, you know. Um, it's the biggest battle the U.S. Army's ever fought. Uh, how much impact did the events in Russia have on American public opinion towards the war? So, the events in Russia are kind of a are kind of a, a political gift to some degree for the Wilson administration, right? The Wilson administration does not, Wilson himself, I shouldn't say his administration, Wilson himself, it's always just Wilson, okay? Wilson does not want to identify the USA with an autocratic government, okay? So events in Russia seem at least acceptable enough for a US, Russian, US allied sort of alliance, right? Um, after though, November, all bets are off, right? I mean, the West doesn't actually know what's exactly happening in Russia because they're not getting accurate reporting 
out of Russia in the first few weeks after the revolution. Okay? So there's not a ton of information that's being shared. How did the U.S. Army end up in Siberia? Well, the U.S. Army ends up in Siberia um, largely because the British, well, so in Siberia, but also they're, they're, but they're also farther north in Russia, too. Oh, okay. so, um, so they end up intervening to protect Allied resources within those areas. The, the Brits are there, too. The Brits are in Russia as well. Um, and they're trying to protect their resources and casually aid the white Russians without actually aiding them. So, yep. Do you have any idea how many Brits and Canadians and Aussies and New Zealanders were killed at the left wing? Uh, a lot. Yeah, it's a lot. I mean, there, there are over 100,000 casualties in that campaign, but the campaign's waged from April until December of 1915. So, um, so you, see, you see a lot of casualties. Not all of them are killed, of course. You must, you know, it's about a one in four chance of that sort of thing. But yeah, there's, I mean, the, the Gallipoli campaign is very costly. Is that Winston Churchill's fault? That's a tough question. Um, <laughs> there's a new book out called Churchill and the Dardanelles. I'd suggest picking it up. <laughs> uh, there's been a lot of back and forth about Churchill's involvement, and um, and I think it would be irresponsible of me to come down and say one man was at fault for the whole campaign. Um, yeah. Well, he certainly doesn't. Um, Though he was a good poet. He was a keen poet. Most people don't realize that the General Sir Ian Hamilton was actually a very good poet before the war, best-selling poet. Um, he maybe should have stuck to writing poetry. Um, because Central Pennsylvania would be um, a German area, was there pro-German um, feelings, okay, in Central Pennsylvania at all? Well, I just finished um, a research project with a former student of mine in which we went uh, we spent a lot of time going through local archives, but also she went through, and I helped her a little bit with it, but it was mostly her, she went through every single day of Gettysburg's papers uh, from 1914 until 1918. And in that, she didn't find any significant sympathy for Imperial Germany. Um, there was a lot of sympathy for Belgium and the plight of Belgians. Um, but after, after like January,